Well, hello everybody and welcome back to my YouTube channel. If you are new to my channel, hello to you. And if you are not, thank you so much for coming back. The title for this message is Lord Open My Eyes and it's based on Luke chapter two. So listen, I have my Bible right here and I also have my notebook right here. If you wanna go get a Bible and a notebook and a pen to take some notes, you can pause the video now. But when you come back, we're gonna dive in and get started. When I'm studying God's Word or reading God's Word, I go between a few different translations. I love the New Living Translation. I love the New International Version. I love the Amplified Version, um, the New King James Version, the King James Version. I'm going to do a video talking about Bible translations and how to choose the one that's right for you. But for the sake of this video, I will be using the New Living Translation Version. So I wanted to start at um, chapter 2, verse 6 through 7. So up until verse 6, Augustus, who was the Roman Emperor at the time declared a national census for the whole or throughout the whole Roman Empire and this required families to return back to their own ancestral towns and because Joseph focusing on Joseph and Mary because Joseph was in the lineage of David he had to return back to his hometown of Bethlehem so Joseph and Mary they're traveling back to Bethlehem and what happens Mary starts having some serious contractions and she's like oh my gosh I'm about to give birth to the Savior <laughs> to the messiah so now we're at verse six and i'm going to read it from the new living translation version and it says and while they were there the time came for her baby to be born verse seven she gave birth to her first child a son she wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them i really want to focus in on verse seven when you think of jesus what picture or what image do you often see displayed on Christmas cards or in the stores. There's a name for it. I'll just go ahead and give you a hint or I'll just tell you what it is. The nativity scene. And what do you think about when you think of the nativity scene? What is it? The nativity scene is what we think of when we think of Christ's birth, right? Um, we think of animals, sheep, lamb, um, shepherds, the wise men, Mary and Joseph all peering down in this manger looking at Christ and maybe an angel or something up here and like pretty lights, hay on the ground. That's what we think of, right? When we think of Christ's birth and that's what the nativity scene depicts. However, I'm gonna give you a little history lesson on what theologians really believe um, was the setup, the true nativity scene of Christ's birth. Stables weren't just the, um, what we describe to be where like a horse goes in for the night and with hay piles and things like that. That's not historically around this time what a stable technically was. A stable was a dark cave with troughs or mangers carved into the walls as feeding places for the animals. So despite what we know about the nativity scene today, despite what Christmas cards display, despite the cute little Christmas setup in Target or Home Goods of the nativity scene, that's not the real nativity scene. A stable is really a dark cave with a manger carved into the wall as a feeding place for animals to come into. And this is not what the Jews expected, their Lord, the Messiah, the King of Kings, the Savior. This is not the atmosphere that they expected him to be in. However, Christ was born in darkness. Theologians suggest that he was born in a manger which would have been inside of a stable which historically was a dark cave. So truly the birthplace of Christ was dark and dirty. And the Bible says there was no lodging available for them. The Bible says she wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger, comma, because there was no lodging available for them. So if this story was to be given back to the Jews then that did not know about Christ's birthing place, they might be like, a manger? You have my Lord born in a manger? No, pause, calm down, breathe comma because there was no lodging available for them there's so many things <laughs> we can get out of this lesson alone and it's important that we don't overlook scripture when you read scripture read with your eyes open read alert go and say lord what are you going to reveal to me today look at it this way jesus paid the price when he hung up on that cross he conquered sin the day he was up on that cross. He conquered, he overcame the darkness the day he was up on that cross. And he came into this world in darkness. He was born in darkness. He was born in a manger 
because there was no other place for him. There was no, no one could open up their doors. I'm sure Mary and Joseph stopped at some people's houses. And I don't believe they were just traveling, traveling, traveling. In my heart, and I'm not saying this is true, but in my heart, I don't believe that there wasn't one person God allowed for them to encounter in which they asked for help. In return, they weren't helped. I truly believe that God was intentional in this. Okay, so now moving down to eight and nine. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. And suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. And they were terrified. How would you feel? <laughs> How would you feel if suddenly right now an angel of the Lord appeared to you and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded you? I would be terrified too. <laughs> I'm just saying I would be scared too. I would be nervous. But yet the angel goes on in verse 10 to comfort them by saying, don't be afraid. He said, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, verse 13, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. I can't imagine how the shepherds must have felt truly. I know the Bible says they were terrified, but I wonder what was going on in their mind to be before an angel of the Lord. And not only that, go down to verse 13, suddenly yet again, too many sudden stuff is happening. I'll be like, wait, Lord, slow down. I can only take it one at a time. Suddenly, the angel of the Lord was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, a vast host. That means many, that means a lot. Break the scripture down word by word. This really opened up my eyes because I just said, wow, how often do we underestimate the Lord's glory? How often do we underestimate the Lord, period? How often do we go day by day, go to church as a routine, study God's word, listen to some gospel music here and there, but we still miss, we still don't truly experience and understand the Lord's glory. How do you receive God's glory? And not only how do you receive it, how do you understand it? How do you grasp it? How do you view it? Is it of importance to you? Do you truly get it? Do you truly, truly weigh it out? Do you truly understand the, the significance of the Lord's glory? How passionate are you when it comes to praise and worship? How passionate are you when it comes to understanding who God is? This convicted me. I'm being honest. This really convicted me because it challenged me to truly get to know who God is more and just doing it for the rest of my days. I want to just experience that, that allness, that fullness, that wholeness of who God is because God is, he's the Lord. He is the Lord, you know? And if I'm gonna say that I'm a child of God, if I'm going to say that I'm living my life for him, I need to first back up and truly understand who the Lord is. This was just really empowering to me, the whole, image of what's going on in this moment another thing too the armies of heaven we are truly backed up by an army we on earth are truly backed up by an army of angels in heaven there is currently right now as you watch this video in heaven an army that's fighting on our side. If you go to Ephesians 6 12 it tells you the things that we're battling against in this world and it also talks about things that are happening in within the heavenly realms. That is in Ephesians 6, 12. Uh, one of the three is happening within the heavenly realms. There's a war right now, not just on earth, but there's a spiritual war going on within the heavenly realms and we have the baddest team on our side, an army of heaven. Can you just imagine that? Heaven has an army, so we can't underestimate this. We gotta open our eyes and really look at God's word and say, wow, <laughs> wow. This is real. This faith talk is real. God is real. The st heaven is real. His power is real. His magnificence is real. And you want to experience that for yourself. My prayer for myself and for you today is, Lord, open my eyes. Open our eyes and help us to see you for who you are. The Bible says that Christ looks at our heart. Christ really looks within. He wants to really know you. And he really does know you. 
He's not just seeing the actions. He's not just seeing what everybody else sees. He's not just seeing what everybody else says about you. No, he wants to know the real you. And he does know the real you because he looks at your heart. And that's my prayer for us. God, help us to know who you are. Help us to not be settled and comfortable. Help us to not get settled and comfortable with what our preachers and pastors are telling us. Help us to go above and beyond that. And I'm not dissing them. I want to make sure I clarify that because I love my pastor. Pastor Kenlock, best pastor to me bias I go to Triumph Church but I'm saying going to church Sunday morning is not enough taking in that message from the pastor that should not be enough for you I mean that should not be the cap for you doing going to a Bible study should not just be the cap for you you should be wanting to know who God is for you because truly who God is is mind-blowing and it's, he reveals himself ever so clearly ever so intentionally ever so purposefully in his word you just got to open it up and read it and continuing on to verse 15 it says when the angels had returned to heaven the shepherds said to each other let's go to bethlehem let's see this thing that has happened which the lord has told us about let's see this thing this magnificent thing whatever this thing is let's see what it is let's go see for ourselves what it is what god just told me through the angel of the lord who is the lord what was just revealed to me is not enough i want to go see it for myself okay and that's exactly what they did they hurried to the village and found mary and joseph and there was the baby lying in the manger and after seeing him the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel and what the angel had said to them about this child and all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished but mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often there's a message in that too what are you keeping in your heart so many things can be going on around you but what are you allowing yourself to meditate and reflect on mary chose to keep all of this in her heart she was probably overwhelmed i can't she just gave birth to the messiah i would just probably be keeping some stuff <laughs> inside too and just reflecting and meditating on some things so what are you choosing to internalize and dwell on for yourself so now we're at a part in the chapter where mary and joseph brought jesus to the temple and they encounter a man named simeon oh simeon this is what i'm gonna end the video on um but it's verse 25 let's go there at that time there was a man in jerusalem named simeon he was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the messiah to come and rescue israel the holy spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the lord's messiah that day verse 27 that day the spirit led him to the temple that day the day that jesus mary and joseph were in the temple that day the holy spirit led him to the temple so when mary and joseph came to present the baby jesus to the lord as the law required simeon was there and what did he do he took the child in his arms and praised god all this praise going on i'm loving it praise god saying sovereign lord now let your servant die in peace as you have promised i have seen your salvation which you have prepared for all people he is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people, Israel. He said to Mary, the baby's mother, This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall, but he will be a joy to many others. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. He was opposed in his when he was in the womb. He couldn't, Mary couldn't find a place to have him. He was already being opposed before he even came out of her womb. And as a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your very soul referring to his death um the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed you've really got to understand that god looks at the heart you can't fake god you can't fake out your life for god you gotta he knows truly so it's better for you to just be honest god can't bless what you pretend to be that's a common saying because he can't if you really want to experience healing, if you really want to experience change, you have to be your authentic self. You got to pour out your authentic self to God. But let's back up and talk about Simeon. So Simeon was in the temple. The temple then was our modern day church. So Christ already as a newborn, an infant, a baby, was already in his dwelling place, the temple, the church. And there were people there. And Mary and Joseph just casually brought him in to do the purification offering but no one recognized who he was. That day, the Holy Spirit led Simeon to the temple. And Simeon was the only man to truly recognize who that baby was. And he knew it wasn't just a baby. 
I want to focus on Simeon's character. Why Simeon out of all people? Why was it Simeon that recognized who Christ was and no one else? Well, let's back up because it tells us. Verse 25, it says he was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. These three words alone, righteous, devout, and eagerly waiting for the Messiah, tells us that Simeon found favor in God's eyes. He was already he was waiting in expectation for christ to come he was waiting for his birth he was excited to know that the savior god is about to send us a savior finally and there's another factor that really set simeon apart it says in verse 25 the holy spirit was upon him okay now listen what can we take away from that when we believe the gospel when we believe that Christ died on the cross for our sins and rose three days later and that he's the son of God, when we accepted him as the Lord and Savior of our lives, we were sealed, okay, with the Holy Spirit. You actually have God dwelling within you right now. You actually have God dwelling within you right now. I was just watching a sermon by Mike Todd called Damaged Goods, part one. And he was focusing on the verse in Genesis where he, God said, let us make them in our image. And what, who, who was he referring to when he said, let us make them in our image? He was referring to the Holy Trinity. He was referring to God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And Mike Todd was just saying how God made a spirit before flesh. God made our spirit person before our flesh person. And so, when you started believing in Christ, you were sealed with him, the Holy Spirit. You have God dwelling in you right now. So that's already covered. You don't have to doubt that if you're a professing believer. But the Bible says that the Holy Spirit was upon Simeon. So not only was the Holy Spirit dwelling within Simeon, he was also upon Simeon. He was on Simeon. He was residing among not just within, but among Simeon. Priscilla Shire said it best. She said, I want God, I want his Holy Spirit to dwell upon me. Yes, Lord. I want your Holy Spirit to dwell upon me, not just within me, but I want you to be all around me. I want you to be all up on me so that when someone sees me that they can say, there's something different about that girl. If I was a part of a Bible story and my name was written in the Bible, I would want to be described as Simeon was. I want to be described as righteous, devout, and eagerly waiting for Christ. And not only that, but that the Holy Spirit was upon me because that automatically sets me apart. That's favor. That's God on you all the time. And how many people in that temple did not have God's Holy Spirit upon them? Did not have God's Holy Spirit, did not have the Holy Spirit upon them. And for that reason, they didn't know who entered the building. They didn't know who just walked in. But Simeon knew. And that's why Simeon approached Mary and Joseph and embraced Christ and said, Lord, I praise you, he's here. And that's the beauty. That's honestly the beauty of Christ today. I love him so much. Christ is so loving to give us, you know, chance after chance after chance, repeat after repeat after repeat to get it, to truly understand, to truly know, to go deeper, to get it right, to open our eyes and see him for who he is. Second Peter 3, 9 says in the New Living Translation version, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise. Mm -mm, he's not really being slow. If you feel like he's delaying on something or you can't hear him or he's taking his time, he's not being slow, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake and my sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. And the message version says, don't overlook the obvious here, friends. With God, one day is as good as a thousand years, a thousand years as a day. God isn't late with his promise as some people measure lateness. He is restraining himself on account of you, holding back the end with a capital E because he doesn't want anyone lost. He's giving everyone space and time to change. God loves you more than you know. He loves you beyond belief, beyond what you can understand, beyond what you did yesterday, beyond your past, beyond your mistakes. I don't even care what you did, okay? God looks at sin all the same. Sin is sin, period. Sin still exists, holiness still exists, but sin is still sin. And that's why he's holding back because he's given us time, y'all. He's given us time to wake up, but not just wake up, but to stay woke. He's waiting for us to wake up and to stay woke and see the truth and to really get it. 
really ask yourself this are my eyes open to the truth do i really see this makes me think back to the story in second kings chapter six um, with elijah and his servant and aram the servant woke up one morning and saw the opposing enemy and their troops and chariots and got scared basically and went to elijah and said lord basically he said what are we going to do <laughs> do you not see do you not see what's out there? Do you not see our enemy? What are we going to do? And Elijah responded in chapter 6 saying, Don't be afraid for there's more on our side than on theirs. And, and in that moment, he prayed. Elijah prayed to God, Oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. And in that moment, the Bible says he opened the young man's eyes. And when he looked up, he saw the hillside around Elijah filled with horses and chariots of fire. Satan wants you to feel like there's more against you than what's for you. He wants to keep your eyes closed. He wants to keep you blinded from the truth. He wants to make you feel afraid. He wants to make you feel like you can't move forward because of your past. He wants to make you believe that God doesn't love you the same. He wants to deceive you. But yet Elijah prayed, open his eyes, open the servant's eyes and let him see. And in the moment, in that moment, God answered his prayers and opened up the young man's eyes. My prayer for you and I today is that God opens up our eyes to really see. That we don't, we no longer see the way the world sees. We no longer do what the world does. We no longer operate how the world operates because we have a different perspective. We have a different vantage point. We're seeing from a different mountaintop. Our eyes are set on things above. The Bible says to set your realities on the things of heaven. You can't be looking down at earth. You got to open your eyes. You got to get it. Embrace the truth. Pray to God, Lord. And I had to ask for forgiveness too. I said, Lord, forgive me for what I thought were open eyes. But I realized part of, you know, one eye was still closed. Um, and it, just with that one eye being closed, it still affected me. And I had to ask God for forgiveness on that. And I just had to say, Lord, keep my eyes open. I want to embrace you in, in your fullness. I want to know you deeply. I want to really, I want to experience you in a way I've never experienced you before. So again, my prayer is that you can move forward um, with, with open eyes. My prayer is that you move forward with a different game plan. That you no longer walk the way you used to. That you no longer talk the way you used to. That you no longer allow the enemy to haunt you and taunt you and discourage you with your past. Because he did that to me for a long time. A long time. And I had to really call him out and just say, you know what? Enough is enough. Know who you are in Christ. Know your identity in Christ. I'll be doing another video on identity in Christ. But it's so important that you understand. But in order for you to understand, in order for you to see God's word and really inherit the truth and not just read the scripture and gloss over it and then go on with your day as if you didn't read it, you got to open your eyes. Thank you for watching this video and I'll talk to you next time.